Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I was very excited about that. I am Bethany. This is Sparky. We're from the Puppy Academy, trying to be organized here. This is Isla. This is Isla. And she's sweet. She, look at this dog. Oh, oh, my God. What episode is this? Uh, 130. This is right where? It's where? highlighted. Oh, the highlighted part? <laughs> okay. Okay. This is episode number 130. <laughs> how, Isla, you can't eat the mic. I'm how sorry. you guys can submit your puppy questions. Your puppy needs to be under two years old. You can hop on Instagram and you can direct message us. Uh, your questions. You can also just put comments down below, put comments on YouTube, wherever you're at. We will try to get to them. Um, I have three sheets of questions. So if we don't get to your question, uh, just keep resubmitting and, and we'll, we'll catch you. All right. And let me point something out, guys. You saw how hyper this puppy was, what, 30 seconds ago. The way I was holding her makes her very hyper. When you kind of hold from the side and do a deep pressure massage, I kind of just feel her melt into me every time I start. And then I stop. And she gets a little bit more excited. But when you really just go slow with those pets, deep pressure massage in the shoulder blades, I feel her melt against me. Yeah. So that's something a lot of people are probably dealing with. It's probably a few of her questions as well. Yeah. I just answered it for you. You're welcome. Your, your, how you touch your dog will a lot of times, you know, depend on what you get. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting a biting, nipping puppy, you, they either don't want to be pet and want to be worked or you're accidentally touching them to elicit excitement instead of calm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump. This camera's messed up. TikTok's all messed up. Why is TikTok messed up? I'm right like in the middle. It's perfect. Hi, TikTok. They can't see my right shoulder. They can see you fine. <laughs> all right. Michelle says, <laughs> hi there from Scotland. I love your channel. Can't get enough of it. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, she has a seven-year-old dog and she's got a 13-week-old lab and she's had the lab for about a month and she's having a lot of issues with barking and crate. So the schedule that you sent us, Michelle, it, it really looks great. But every time the puppy is in crate, it might not sleep very well or it wakes up and it won't stop barking. You know, my question is, are you letting your puppy out when it barks? And when your puppy is barking and you're like, oh no, it probably needs to potty. When you go to let your puppy out, make sure that you kind of just stand in front of the crate first and you kind of just pause for a second. And then when you go to open the door, you open it only a couple of inches. When you're, when, if your puppy kind of leans forward, just gently shut the door. And what you want to see, even if your puppy needs to pee, even if they have a tinkle, it is worth it to do this. They'll learn how to hold their bladder better, is you want to see some sort of backwards reaction. So your puppy does not have to know sit or down to be able to accomplish this in crate. It's just pressure work. It's spatial pressure work. So you shut that crate in and you might have to do it a few times. And once the puppy has this kind of back up, like you kind of see their brain mentally back up rather than push, push, push forward, then let's go and you can let them out. So that's how you can let a barking or whining puppy out of crate. If you think your puppy is barking at a really significant time, maybe it's an hour instead of an hour and a half, I would try to jump, if you're home, I would try to jump on the other end of that and get them out before that barking pattern happens and then try to increase it. And I would also just wonder how much affection you're sharing, how much freedom the dog is getting when they're out. It seems like she's following the train. <laughs> it seems like she's following the train play schedule really well. She's fine. She's going to go poop. And so sometimes it's just... <laughs> Sometimes it's just an issue of, um, of age and getting used to it, but try to try that with the crate and then come back with us with feedback after working on it for a bit. What was the actual question? Um, I just said what the question was, was barking in crate oh, before okay. the, before the window of time was up in our schedule that we sent. Okay. Maria says, I'm not sure you can help, but I love your opinion. Well, pff, all right. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the confidence, Maria. All right, we're 98. It was a personal challenge. It wasn't confidence. <laughs> That's sarcasm. You, sh you should recognize sarcasm, it's, Sparky. It's how I live. It's like you're dripping with it all the time. Um, we are 98% sure that we're ready for a new puppy, but we're having one disagreement. Oh, I love these. I get marital counseling. It's perfect. My husband, <laughs> my husband works 24-hour shifts as an EMT. Oh, my God. Bless your heart, husband. Oh, my Lord. Um, but it's home five days a week. I'm gone from the house Monday through Friday, seven to five. So more typical schedule. He's looking for a new job, uh, uh, like a normal job. We're wondering if it's better to get one now because he's home 
five days a week all day, and then I'm guessing he does like a five day on shift is how it works, um, or if it's better to wait till he gets the new job. My concern with waiting is the puppy will be in crate for a long time, it makes crate training, potty training harder, all those things. Interactions with the puppy will be fewer. Do you think it's better? With him home five days a week or, when, or with a new job, um, it's more stable schedule, but longer periods when gone. Do you want to jump off on that? Yeah, because I got my opinion. I'm curious if yours is the same. All right. I say get the puppy now with him home five days a week. However, that is a large commitment. That's like having a kid. That's a couple hours in the crate, time out of the crate, structure it all throughout. But if you're going to eventually jump to then him, or you guys both working normal schedules where you're gone, let's say nine to five, seven to four, whenever it is, you need to make sure that puppy understands his role up into that point. So that means that when you start with your puppy now, the five days that you are home, you're doing pretty strict structure because you're trying to build up that bladder control now. Mm -hmm. So then when you have that other job, maybe you can hire a rover to come in after four and a half hours of the dog being in the crate, give him a potty, and then he stays in for another three and a half to four hours until you guys get home. That is my opinion that you should start it now, you should get the puppy now, and you should do some really intense crate training and structure schedule training. That way you get a good bladder control and also your puppy knows exactly what's expected out of them. And then you could even get ready for that if they don't have the bladder control you're looking for, you could do like a playpen type setup to where you have the potty pad in there, you have your water bowl, and you're almost already conditioning them part way with that and the other half with the crate. To be alone for long periods of time. Yes, and if your dog is able to hold it for four and a half hours, four hours, then you could just do the rover idea. Um, I have a lot of clients that come to our puppy academy school that do that and it costs about 10, 15 bucks per day just to do it. So you budget that out. I'm sure it's different for every area, but but yeah. it, it's really common here in LA. So, yeah. so it's on the cheaper side. Yep. Um, I will say that for me, I agree with Sparky on I would get the puppy now because of all the benefits. However, I was waiting for the butt. Yeah, how I much impulse it. control does your husband have? And this is what I mean by that. When you get a new puppy and you're home, and if you have the time, you tend to want to spend a ton of time with that puppy. Cuddling, loving, kissing. Or, even, or even working with. You know, and, and that's understandable, but it would be cruel to give that puppy all that attention and then all of a sudden he's everybody's gone for two days and then in a few months you're to this new schedule that the puppy's not prepped for. So you would get the puppy and you would do our structure schedule. You can check out our blog to find out um, the Puppy Academy structure schedule. And our online school too. And our online school. Because it guides you through every step of the way. Yep. And we could help you one-on-one -on -one with these types of situations more specifically. But anyway, you would... You would do the structure schedule, I would say, for like two weeks where you are letting the puppy out every couple of hours. And then after the puppy gets into a groove, after the first couple of weeks, you are very specifically trying to increase that and see how the puppy does. And so he's going to be home a lot of the time and the puppy's not going to be out in order to prep the puppy for being alone. That is the hardest absolute It's very thing hard. Very for hard. For most people. Yeah. And even if you're, even a husband, you're strong. It's going to be tough because you're going to want to spend a lot of time with the puppy. The more you do of this now, the easier it is for the puppy later. Yep. Now, I have a question I don't want to spend too much time on, but I feel like we have to address it. So we get a lot of comments. They are generally on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Oh, YouTube. <laughs> and, and it's okay. I, I completely understand it. Sometimes it's very hard to build full context when we're just asking these questions or doing these or doing these little clips, you know, on YouTube of like, oh, dogs should sleep this much, dogs should drink this much, eat this much. It's very hard to get full context. So let me for, let me set the record straight. All right, when we say your puppy could be sleeping anywhere from 16 to 20 hours a day, we do want some of that time to be out with you in a playpen scenario where they're just, or, or in even in a, a crate in the living room, but just an area where they're with you, but they still need to be up in a crate in a quiet room many hours a day plus at night and it can be the same room that you sleep in. So here's the reason why. It is fun, it's fundamental to their development to make sure that they get enough sleep just like it is for infants. Yeah, the lights it's flickering. It's flashing on me. <laughs> Sorry, we got a st strobe going on. 
uh, it's really fundamental for their development, just like it is for babies, to get enough sleep. And what happens is when we spend a ton of time with our dogs and they're out of crate and they're constantly being overstimulated, especially if you have kids or a busy household, you can accidentally create an overstimulated, edgy, anxious puppy. And so the crate helps us with a lot of things. It helps them know when to take naps. It helps them uh, with their potty training. But I think people get the wrong idea. So let's say you sleep eight hours a night. If you're if you're lucky, the puppy is sleeping, you know, seven to nine hours a night. Uh, we get that around four, five, six months old, pretty mm -hmm. commonly. And the rest of the day is broken up into intervals, usually of two to three hours. And so they're coming out. They're getting worked with. They're getting played with. They're getting a little bit of time out with you, just relaxing. And then they're getting nap time. And that rotation is happening all day long. That's our suggestion. So it's not like we're putting the dog in the crate for 16 hours with two potty breaks and they're, they're not getting any attention. They're getting tons of fulfillment, just like school. Like you go to school, you work, you play, you get nap time. I'm talking about young kids, of course. You know, you go to, and then you get your work and play. Then you come home and you have a snack and you have a nap. I mean, it's a schedule, just so, like with that any- That sounds like me when I get off of work. <laughs> that, that was my day right there. You, you wish. <laughs> uh, just, you know, just, just like with anything else. So I think people sometimes get the wrong idea when we say things like that. So I wanted to be really clear. Now, if one more thing, if you're the type of owner, that has to work for eight hours and your puppy is um, you know, up for eight hours and not having that interaction, then yes, when your, your schedule, when your home is gonna look a little bit different. But that's, I mean, dogs spend for uh, thousands of years, hours and hours outside and they still get worked with and they still you know, have things to do and they have a very happy life. So if you can't do our perfect structure schedule, that's okay too. Um, it just, you know, you can always let us know if you have questions about that. Okay, do you want to add to that or was that good? I just wanted to address that because uh, Emily said, oh, well, don't get a dog. It's such a sad life. I'm like, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, how that's why she didn't, let, she didn't let me read it. I would have laughed at you sooner. <laughs> that's literally how much they actually sleep. It's just we're putting a schedule to it. I, one thing I always like to ask is <laughs> when a dog is in the wild, what do you guys think they do all day? Eat, sleep, mate, and stay in their den. That's about it. They don't roam. They don't walk. They literally have three purposes they come out of their den for. And if they're not doing one of those three purposes, they're sleeping in the den recuperating. And I know he said dog in the wild, but, but let's just talk about packs of dogs that work outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can, go on huskies, yeah. you, you can go on Instagram. You can find lots of huskies and protection dogs over, over yeah. um, a livestock. And they, they sleep most of the day. They're up at night, actually, usually. But anyway, I don't want to get into all that. You get the point. We can move on. Um, Allison says, Golden Doodle, five months old. Way to follow the rules, Allison. We want age and breed. Uh, how to stop jumping on the counter and jumping on the playpen when wanting attention. So the playpen, if they're jumping on the playpen, your playpen's done. You probably aren't gonna have a playpen dog. You could try doing a small rattle with the playpen just to see if you can kind of like make them move away from it. You walk but up, if he's... no, little rattle, mm -hmm. pause, puppy calms down, back away. If that works, awesome. Some dogs it works, so some dogs it doesn't. If it doesn't though, you're probably gonna be a back tie dog. So you're gonna have a dog bed, uh, elevated pet cot, whatever you wanna use, and then some kind of tether behind it. Um, you can do a fisheye in the baseboard. You could do a kettlebell, a couple weights, whatever you can. Kitchen, Tie the leash yeah, to the it, table. clip it to the harness. Make sure they can get a little bit farther than the, than the place cot, than the dog bed. And they have like a four foot roam space. I'll put a toy or two down there. Uh, maybe a chew if I want them to be interested in the chew and kind of just self-sufficient. This isn't all day. This is for short periods of time Correct. when your puppy's not in crate and not being worked mm -hmm. with or played with. But it's also very important that your puppy can do all that without the dog chew, without maybe having a couple toys. You're working, she mentioned, you're working towards that. Because she mentioned also that your puppy also sleeps outside the crate. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily cuddling with, cuddling with you on the couch. Right. That usually is what creates separation anxiety. Yeah. It's going to be on that place, on that dog bed, on that cot, whatever you can. What was, what just, was that again? Can I, can I hear that again? Place and, did I say cot? No, you said separation anxiety. No, the singing. Oh, I, oh, I, I oh. love the singing. Separation anxiety. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a lyric Josh, I sing every day now. Josh, that's a clip. You got to edit that. You got to use it like every other thing. Josh is going to do it with his baritone. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> What are we getting into? I what did no you start? Idea. I'm so sorry. So anyway, when it comes to the counter jumping, 
it, you can definitely punish counter jumping, uh, countertop jumping and to decrease the likelihood of that. But the problem is with a five month old puppy, they're so young, they're just going to push through it and figure out a way to work around it. So you need a bit more maturity, a bit more age before you can say no, in my opinion, to something like that. You're working more preventatively to prevent it from happening when you're not around. And then just make sure you're setting boundaries with your puppy. For now, if it happened, say like um, we have, I have a table in front of me, say the puppy put paws on the table, I would stand up, say no, turn and face the puppy, like if he's the puppy, and, and push, oh. push him off, push is a bad word, bump him off, and, and make him give space from the counter. No, and then redirect him back to place. I want at you five, to... Wait, wait, at five months old, you can absolutely teach him how to do that. However, it is not gonna make him not jump on the counter when you're not looking. That's more management with a puppy. I what were you gonna my, say? I lost my train of thought. Good. Oh, no, I got it back. Oh, man. Nah, tough, I was tough gonna move you. on. Spatial pressure, it's actually a form of it. I want you to think about your puppy is jumping on that counter to claim a new space and you almost have to think about it a little bit more primal. It's them trying to claim a territory that has a good resource they want. Spatial pressure is taking that space, reclaiming it, and taking ownership of it. So and then you, redirecting to what you, you do want him to so do. So when you move into the dog to get him off it, when you do that bump that Bethany was mentioning, you then have to do your redirection, which means picking up leash, guiding them to a different space. Yeah. And the preventive side of this is not giving enough freedom to get to that area if it's constantly creating a mistake. That's because the management, if, I already said that. It is the management, I agree. Okay, cool. <laughs> See, when he talks in, he makes me think of things, and then, oh, so if that's not- No, well, no, 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 okay, go, yeah. No, okay, so when people try the whole spatial pressure thing, this is for everybody, when you're trying to you know, get a handle on anything, and they try the spatial pressure thing, the reason you think it's not working is because people rarely follow through. They'll kind of just bump their dog off, or they jump on, they bump the dog off, and then they just, walk away and the dog the brain is not actually in a more passive calmer follower mode they're still thinking about mm -hmm. jumping on you or the counter or the excitement you have to follow through meaning you have to really move into the dog a little bit make them give space and then you just need to pause face your dog breathe for a second see what they're gonna do, then redirect them to what you wanna do. Make sure they're settled into that redirection or they're just gonna jump up and jump on the counter again for the sponge or the chicken or whatever it is. you could be there for two, three minutes in a row with yep. your dog constantly jumping, you constantly blocking, waiting for that passive follower mode to kick in, yep. and then you can redirect that next. And if you don't wanna do that, leash and more management, bottom mm -hmm. line. Uh, do we have questions we should answer? We've got a couple long ones. Yeah. We have some over here, I can't tell if they're questions or just Okay, so I'm gonna look at, let's see. Uh, I thank you, thank you for your bids. You're very welcome. Our crazy pup is becoming slightly more obedient day by day. Ah, all right, cool. Um, I also crate trained her as well. I take her out every three hours and let her play outside for an hour. If that works for you, awesome. I will say an hour to play by herself. It can be a little bit long. Some puppies can get in trouble if they're not supervised outside. Um, but if your puppy's doing great, good, it's just sometimes that can lead to digging or eating plants, things like that. You might want to add just a bit more supervision to that, but, but nice job. Let's jump over to Instagram here. We will be bringing home our eight week old Bernadoodle puppy. Woohoo! I love Bernadoodles. In less than two weeks, I was wondering if you have any advice with how to help our seven year old. Uh, understand boundaries with our puppy. You got it backwards. So I definitely can help with that. By me, I mean not Sparky, just me. I want her to be involved with the training, but make sure she respects puppy and puppy schedule. Wait a minute, seven-year-old is a child, not a dog. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that. First of all, I thought you meant a dog. I knew it was a child. You knew it was a child? I did, that's why when you said that, I was like, I'm gonna let her embarrass herself. <gasps> Okay, well anyway. You poop on me, I poop on you. Actually, you still kind of have it backwards. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you're right, your seven-year-old child should absolutely respect your puppy. I thought it was a dog, whatever. I'm the one with the kid. But at the same time, That's also, sad. it's a seven-year-old child and they don't have the best rationalization skills yet. They're still kind of developing them. Seven years old. She yeah. can to they, you, they, you can start that at like two. Really? No, yeah. I didn't rationalize anything until I became like 12. It's not about rationalization. Um, babies learn in patterns just like dogs do. Make your seven-year-old into a dog trainer. If you, want, <laughs> if you want to develop rules and you want good boundaries, your seven-year-old needs to work with your puppy. You need to create routines that they can do together. But. They're, they're not the same ones that you do with your puppy. But. They're much lighter. Okay, but what? 
What? But if your puppy's jumping all over them and using their That's little different. their yes. little baby That's shark different. teeth, because this is what I see. Baby little shark, little baby shark, shark, shark. No. Baby shark, no. shark, shark. No. Ow! We do not know. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, if <laughs> pinching usually works, I need to pinch harder. No, you don't. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. Uh, it's, it's a day, apparently. A tear um, what was I saying? Okay, so if uh, your little puppy's sharp teeth uh, hurt your little girl's fingers, or little boy, sorry, well, whatever it is, they're not going to want to do anything. So what you could do, in, in my opinion, is, is first, you pretty much do everything the first week or two. And teach your your seven year old to honestly kind of watch more, respect space, and how to touch the puppy properly. I would go ahead and do that. So basically, if the puppy, the two main things I would focus on is when the puppy jumps up on you, be a tree, just be a statue, be a tree. I don't know. I like be a tree, but that might be like this. So be a statue, be a tree, I've and question that, that and that way. just helps. That just helps the the kid not feed into it. And, and call for mom or dad, you, you, they can always do that too. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other side of things is how to touch the puppy and when to touch the puppy. So when the tail is going crazy and the puppy's super excited, we don't pet the puppy. Wait till the puppy's calm, which is your job, you know, to be able to decipher and be like, oh, look how calm new puppy is. Do you want to come over and pet? Okay, sit down next to me. That's already going to get the puppy excited, but that's okay. And you can look at kind of the beginning of this because um, it'll be reposted to see how Sparky was petting the puppy that we had here. And you don't go for the face and the ears. That's going to get your pup, your kid start to be nipped at really and chewed on really quickly, if not now, but definitely around the 11 to 13 week mark. And so go ahead and teach your kid how to, how to kind of rub the shoulders really calmly, you know, almost like a massage. Like, and you can teach him just how to do it. Not, not like this flat handed pet, but like just use the fingers and scratch or massage the puppy slowly and go ahead and teach how to pet calmly. When the puppy gets too excited, pull your hands up, be a tree, ignore the puppy. So th those would be kind of some of the things that I would start with. Once sit is really good, but you have to teach these basics first. Once sit, once sit and calm is really good, then you can teach your kid to do it. And even if your kid doesn't like it because of the way it feels on the hand, have them feed the treat flat handed. If it falls on the floor, no big deal. They can just do come and then a piece of food. Come, piece of food, sit, piece of food. And just make sure you're, you've done that first for like a few days or a week or two. All right, that's how I would start. Cool. You got more questions too. Yeah. Oh, you're cool. You're looking I on there. I just pulled them up here just because I don't feel like leaning in anymore. All right. Um, you, you find a question. I'm just going to jump here. Uh, Blue says, 15-week-old Australian Shepherd. It's my favorite, so I'm prioritizing you. Um, blue says, I can send videos. And actually, that's... So everyone just say you have a blue healer, <laughs> blue Aussie, and you'll get in. We'll definitely... We do review videos if you're a member of our online school, which is thepuppyacademy.com, and then you click on the online part. We do review videos on that if you're a part of the school. Puppy learn to be open. Puppy learn to open his crate. Oh, you just clip it. You just, just go to Lowe's and get like those leash clips and just carabiner clip, clip. clip it or a carabiner clip. Um, barks all day while at work, jumps out of his pen, even though it's covered. Well, yeah, you got an Australian shepherd. They're smart as a whip. Mm, um, they're not unzip things. Just so you know. <laughs> um, honestly, this may sound ridiculous, but if you work for long periods of time, I would get a large crate, which is kind of like a playpen. So a you've got, condo. yeah, exactly. So you got your small crate to like teach potty training and, and how to sleep and things like that. And then if you're gone for long periods of time, get a larger crate instead of a playpen and they can have a little water spot and things like that. How many toys in that crate? Oh, when you leave for work, mm -hmm. you have to be so careful with safe toys. They honestly don't chew on them that much while you're gone anyway. I, I'd probably do like a Nyla bone and a Kong as long as it has two open airways, like two holes in the in the Kong. I, I, I'd probably do that. And the that's two holes it. is an important thing. Get their tongues stuck in yeah. it. Yeah, and that's suctions. And that's really that's really it. That's all I would leave with the puppy. The reason we don't like the stuffy toys, and a lot of people are probably using them, is because when you leave and your puppy gets bored, they become destructive. When they destroy the stuffy toy, little little like even threads, the string toys, yeah, they can actually tie up their intestines. Yeah. If you're not home all day, yeah. you're gonna have a bad day. 
my, my thing would, would be, um, if you're gone for long periods of time, you know, don't worry so much about the barking when you're gone. Uh, you just, you just can't, it just is what it is. Unless you've got neighbors of which at that age, hard. that is hard. But at that age, there's not a lot you can do when you're gone. And so really focus on, you know, what are you doing when you're home? Are they waiting in crate to come out? At 15 weeks old, this dog should be sitting and waiting at an open door. The door opens and he's just sitting, waiting for permission to go through. Like start adding in body blocking, waiting for food. Um, how much are you hand feeding this dog for basic obedience work? Um, are you playing with this dog because you feel bad because it's barking all day and you're accidentally creating more crazy and more drive? Like these are the things you got to start analyzing about how you're working with him when you're home is it more calm controlled it can still be fun but it's not chaos um, and then you can come back with some follow-up questions or check out our online school if you're what interested about demanding permissiveness is the puppy coming up putting a toy in your lap and you're playing with them is the puppy coming up pawing at you and you pet them they True. come up look at you and you put them on the couch yep all these things are why they can bark because they're demanding something that if they're out of the crate they could walk up and do right next to you they're demanding because they're not right next to you. Your accident, you might accidentally be cultivating a very pushy, demanding dog okay. that is stressed out when when you leave. Let's let's let me grab one of these. Um, I've had oh, a yeah. ten. Can week... we to do TikTok or do Instagram next? Uh, we just yeah, we that that long one was Instagram. Was it? Okay. Don't, yeah, I know what I'm doing. For sure. All right, I've had a ten-week-old puppy for five days, and I feel like I haven't seen him smile. I don't understand. Are you screwing with us? You're messing with us? Just skip it. He just doesn't seem happy. Hmm. Dogs don't smile. Or are you being ornery? Dogs don't smile. He just seems sad. 10 week old puppy, five days. So here's the thing. There's something, okay. Could be, could be sad. Um, however, are you, are, like, what are you trying to do with this puppy would be, would be my question where you think he seems sad. Maybe you just got a calm puppy. I do want to say this. This goes for everybody, not just you. This may not be an issue. I went to someone's house one time where the where the dog, it was a young dog, stopped eating and drinking. And the reason, it, it, it just got a little finicky because they were being, the puppy was being hovered, the dog was being hovered over so much. It was like an eight-month-old dog. And all I had to do was send them out of the room and the dog started eating <laughs> like that. Their anxiety, their worry was manifesting into the dog, making them a very unbalanced person to be around. And it literally made the dog not want to do that anymore. So not want to eat anymore. So if you're feeling like your dog is sad, if you're in worry mode when you're around your dog, it can get so much worse. And so I want, I know it seems silly, but I want you to pretend like it's not a big deal. You're fine. Everything's fine. We're going to do cool stuff. Please keep that in mind because you can create a lot of problems by, by doing that. Dogs are some of the most empathetic creatures on this planet. When we train, when I train them for service for seizure alert and assist, they quite literally can smell a biochemical change in your perspiration. Yep. Pheromones, they're smelling, which means you're stressed, they can become stressed. Yep. Obviously, service animals are training to do the opposite, but if you're feeling stressed or you're feeling worried about this puppy, they're now worried because of your worry. Yep. But they don't rationalize that worry in the same way that you do. They just worry themselves. Yeah, they take it on as emotion. But it's not about being happy around them either. It's about being normal. Balanced. And, and neutral. Balanced. <laughs> and, and, you know, are you hand feeding your puppy half of his meals to work with him on his basic obedience? Are you playing fetch? And then letting him release it. You know, like, are you adding boundaries to the fun things that you are trying to do? You know, so I would say uh, look at how you're interacting with him the day, during the day as well. Uh, he... Don't go to polar opposites. There's a huge part of the spectrum. Yeah. Huge part of the spectrum. If you're far left, stressed out, they're stressed out. You're far right, they're overexcited. They can't see it on this because it's over here. <laughs> Scoot over. I'm getting on your side now. So you need to be right in the middle. You can be happy during play. To motivate him if you need Correct. if you need to. And then you can be neutral during training. You can have both worlds. You could even train happily and then go down to a lower level to give kind of like that on off switch as well. But that's way more advanced. That's not for 10 weeks. That's for like if, if you're six, honestly, eight months. if you really need help, you gotta check out our online school on thepuppyacademy.com. Mm -hmm. We're um, at 30, just so you know. Thir man, man. Go one more. We have Come so on. many Go good questions. Go 13 week, more. can you be faster? 13 week no. old GSD. This is TSB Madre, Madrid, Madrid, I don't know. 
13 week old madre. G GSD. That's, that's mom, Madre. That's German Shepherd uh, dog pulling grass, mud, not eating, just chewing. How do we redirect and make it stop? It's a 13 week old puppy. It's preventative. It's preventative. Have, don't let him do it. Have him on leash. And every time you go into the yard, it's like what, as soon as he pees or looks like he's about to go, you know, to a piece of food or something, just like puppy, come piece of food and then be neutral again. Show him where you want him to pee. As soon as he pees, get his attention again. It's really just about uh, preventing. At that age, they do want to chew on a lot of stuff. Make sure you'll, you're fulfilling his need to chew in one area through play and teaching him drop it, tug, drop it, things drop like it. that. Yeah, you, you've got to teach an out or a drop it. That's really like the main purpose of, of play because you are practicing him chewing things and fetching things. So you want control over that but you know he'll be fulfilled in that area. So you got no problem telling him no when he gets a little older and for now redirecting, but you gotta have that leash. It's, it's and we'll say this too, just cause it kind of feeds in the same path, which is if they do have something in their mouth and it's not super harmful, it's like a blade of grass, something like that. Don't fight him. Don't pull it out of their mouth. Yeah. You're gonna make them swallow it and you made it a game inadvertently. Yeah. If it's something that is bad, well then, okay, yeah, get it out. And now next time you gotta be a bit more preventative or you might have to police your backyard a bit more. You might need to make sure that you have certain trees that drop certain seeds and that now has a playpen around it, like some kind of blockade. I think he even said mud. You know, and, and so mud. so if I see that, I'm not fighting that. Build up a good immune system, no big deal. Just mm -hmm. redirect it. You're like, look, I got some better stuff. I've got your food or I've got yep. treats, you know, and 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 I would stick with that and then let us know how it goes. 13 week old G German Shepherd, you've got a long way to go to build foundation before you can try to tell your puppy no. I ate mud when I was a little kid. Explains everything. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, um, have a great day and we'll see you same time, same place next week. Awkward Bye. smell and thumbs up. Bye.